The philosophical radicals were a transitional school. Their system gave birth to two others, of more importance than itself, namely Darwinism and Socialism. Darwinism was an application to the whole of animal and vegetable life of Malthus's theory of population, which was an integral part of the politics and economics of the Benthamites. A global free competition in which victory went to the animals that most resembled successful capitalists. Darwin himself was influenced by Malthus, and was in general sympathy with the philosophical radicals. There was, however, a great difference between the competition admired by orthodox economists and the struggle for existence which Darwin proclaimed as the motive force of evolution. Free competition, in orthodox economics, is a very artificial conception, hedged in by legal restrictions. You may undersell a competitor, but you must not murder him. You must not use the armed forces of the state to help you get the better of foreign manufacturers. Those who have not the good fortune to possess capital must not seek to improve their lot by revolution. Free competition, as understood by the Benthamites, was by no means really free. Darwinian competition was not of this limited sort. There were no rules against hitting below the belt. The framework of law does not exist among animals, nor is war excluded as a competitive method. The use of the state to secure victory in competition was against the rules as conceived by the Benthamites, but could not be excluded from the Darwinian struggle. In fact, though Darwin himself was a liberal, and though Nietzsche never mentions him except with contempt, Darwin's survival of the fittest led, when thoroughly assimilated, to something much more like Nietzsche's philosophy than like Bentham's. These developments, however, belong to a later period, since Darwin's Origin of Species was published in 1859, and its political implications were not at first perceived. Socialism, on the contrary, began in the heyday of Benthamism, and as a direct outcome of orthodox economics. Ricardo, who was intimately associated with Bentham, Malthus, and James Mill, taught that the exchange value of a commodity is entirely due to the labor expended in producing it. He published this theory in 1817, and eight years later, Thomas Hodgkin, an ex-naval officer, published the first socialist rejoinder, Labour Defended Against the Claims of Capital. He argued that if, as Ricardo taught, all value is conferred by labour, then all the reward ought to go to labour. The share at present obtained by the landowner and the capitalist must be mere extortion. Meanwhile, Robert Owen, after much practical experience as a manufacturer, had become convinced of the doctrine which soon came to be called socialism. The first use of the word socialist occurs in 1827, when it is applied to the followers of Owen. Machinery, he said, was displacing labor, and laissez-faire gave the working classes no adequate means of combating mechanical power. The method which he proposed for dealing with the evil was the earliest form of modern socialism. Although Owen was a friend of Bentham, who had invested a considerable sum of money in Owen's business, the philosophical radicals did not like his new doctrines. In fact, the advent of socialism made them less radical and less philosophical than they had been. Hodgkin secured a certain following in London, and James Mill was horrified. He wrote, Their notions of property look ugly. They seem to think that it should not exist, and that the existence of it is an evil to them. Rascals, I have no doubt, are at work among them. The fools not to see that what they madly desire would be such a calamity to them as no hands but their own could bring upon them. This letter, written in 1831, may be taken as the beginning of the long war between capitalism and socialism. In a later letter, James Mill attributes the doctrine to the mad nonsense of Hodgkin, and adds, These opinions, if they were to spread, would be the subversion of civilized society, worse than the overwhelming deluge of Huns and Tartars. Socialism, in so far as it is only political or economic, does not come within the purview of a history of philosophy. But in the hands of Karl Marx, socialism acquired a philosophy. His philosophy will be considered in the next chapter.